Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Good to have a lively crew today so far. Amy and Marla and Craig and Dennis and Pedro. I think it's the first time we've had a South American uh, visit on the Dow podcast, isn't it? I think it is, actually. Yeah. Good to have you, Pedro. Welcome. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Announcements, buddyc.org. Go check it out. Look under resources and you can find it all, including the Facebook that Craig talks about every week. So, I'm not going to mention the Facebook group because if you don't, don't mention know. the Facebook group or how much interaction we have or all the things we do on there, Craig. In all fairness, if they don't know about it by now, they haven't really been paying too much attention to what we actually say in the beginning. We may have new people, though, Craig, that have never listened to the podcast, so that's possible. I didn't oh, know there was a Facebook group, Craig. <laughs> that's because you're not on Facebook. Exactly. If you ever decide to move into this century, Amy, we have a Facebook page. It's called the Die Over Understanding Podcast Facebook page. Our original. And it has the same logo, too, as the uh, podcast itself. That's where we post the links for the meeting. And anyone can attend this meeting. Uh, you can even come and just listen. You don't have to participate even. We have folks that do that sometimes. We're going to be doing something different in the month of September. I've gone through the work of Byron Katie with a couple of sponsees, both of which got a lot out of it. And it has been helpful to me. And I thought we would take the month of September and go through uh, what she calls the work. You know, we have a tendency sometimes to think that literature that is going to help us has to be old, right? It has to be something of, you know, uh, thousands of years old before it can be helpful to us, but that's just not the case. And this is an example. And also, too, the work is something that you could share with uh, your non-recovery friends uh, that really helps me with acceptance, actually. Uh, some good questions for working the fourth and fifth step too. So really good stuff. So we're going to start. I will repost the. Uh, hey, buddy, for some of our listeners, maybe they don't know who Byron Katie is. Okay. She is actually, she's the wife of Stephen Mitchell that we read his uh, uh, interpretation of the Tao Te Ching a good bit, but they met well after uh, she uh, had her moment of enlightening, I guess would be the way to say. She's one of these people who uh, was having a tough time with life, and it just was like a, a bright light experience. It just happened for her all at one time. Uh, a lot like uh, Mousy, uh, Eckhart Tolle. A lot like what happened with him. So, uh, you know, just all of a sudden, here it was, you know, and she had the same kind of thing happen for her. Uh, she also did a book on, on the Tao Te Ching, where they went through the Tao Te Ching and talked about each verse, too. So uh, I would suggest or recommend that you uh, just Google her name, Byron, B-Y-R-O-N, Katie as a last name, Byron Katie, uh, and see uh, what comes up, especially a lot of YouTube, a lot of good videos. There's a lot of podcasts, a lot of free information on her website, including the PDF that we're reading through is a free download from her website. And I will put a link in the episode notes for this. So if you want to download it and look at it and see if it's something that's beneficial to you. And what I want to do is start reading on page one and let's just read. And as we read, well, if it, if you guys want, we can take turns reading and just talk about this as we go. And this will start giving us an idea of 
what the work is about. Does that sound like a good approach to you guys? Kate, I put the, uh, I re-uploaded to the chat in case you need, a, need to download a copy. So it's right there. Good to have you today. Um, so I'm going to start on page one. Now, her website is thework.com. It has a lot, a lot more information about her. And I'll start reading the introduction. And if you've got something to uh, comment, just if you would raise your virtual hand or, or interrupt me and we will discuss it. The work by Byron Katie is a way to identify and question the thoughts that cause all the suffering in the world. It is a way to find peace with yourself and with the world. Anyone with an open mind can do this work. Byron Kathleen Reed became severely depressed while in her 30s. Over a 10-year period, her depression deepened, and for the last two years, Katie, as she is called, was seldom able to leave her bedroom. Then one morning, from the depths of despair, she experienced a life-changing realization. Katie saw that when she believed her thoughts, she suffered, and that when she didn't believe her thoughts, she didn't suffer. Wow, how complicated is that, right? What had been causing her depression was not the world around her, but what she believed about the world around her. In a flash of insight, she saw that our attempt to find happiness was backward. Instead of hopelessly trying to change the world to match our thoughts about how it should be, we can question these thoughts and, by meeting reality as it is, experience unimaginable freedom and joy. As a result, a bedridden suicidal woman became filled with love for everything life brings. Hmm. I found that to be the case in recovery, exactly what she said, right? That when she believed her thoughts, she suffered, and that when she didn't believe her thoughts, she didn't suffer. And for me, that really hasn't changed. I still can't believe my thoughts, even now. You know, even after all this time, I can't believe my thoughts. I mean, my, my thoughts change, too. I realize they're really supporting my fear. The thoughts are trying to pacify my fear, so they keep changing to different things. I have a lot of ego-related thoughts. Uh, that I just ignore now, just because I have a thought doesn't mean I did something wrong. I can just say, oh, that's just, you know, my ego again, I, and just ignore it, not believe it, correct? Yeah, just, just what you're talking just about you're reminds talking. me of, um, hang on, and that's just mute, buddy, that's it. So what you were just talking about there reminds me of um, what was in the, the Daily Dow quote that you send out from a couple of days ago, and it was talking about fear. It says, if I pay attention, I can see how fear is always trying to judge, justify, or defend. What difference when I allow love to have its way in my life? And when I read that that morning, that's what I came back to was the, was the Byron Katie part, which is talking about, like, if I start to believe my thoughts, then that's when things start to go wrong. Um, so I kind of related that to, to the fear part that, that you mentioned in that. So it's just kind of timely that this is all kind of coming together. Okay. I was reading this earlier when I was waiting for a friend to come over and the friend was late to, and they were like two hours late. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh, they are so disrespectful. They don't care about me. They're they, you know, I was thinking all these negative thoughts, right? And then I started reading this, reading through this. And then I was thinking, okay, like, maybe I can apply this to my thought. So I was like, okay, that's just a thought that they have no respect for me. Like, let it go. Okay, that's just a thought that they hate me and they don't really care if they come over, let it go. And I found like that really worked to just kind of like let those thoughts bounce away. And then I felt much better. So 
I really liked reading that part of this. The first time I ever really started um, thinking seriously about this idea of not believing my thoughts was when I was reading or listening to Michael Singer's book, Untethered Soul, because he talks in depth about this. And I would suggest that for an audible, for me, an audible book, that book is an audible. It's fantastic. Um, I would suggest reading that or listening to that if you have not already. It is very much a lot. It says things like, if my if my thoughts were a friend, I would not be friends with them anymore. <laughs> you know, we just totally ignore it. You know, we we don't believe, you know, whatever my thoughts tell me, it doesn't happen. And all of a sudden, the next time the thoughts start, start that up again, I believe it again. It's like, it's like a very bad friend. Who would like to read? Uh, Marla, how about uh, reading the next uh, paragraph there, please? Okay. Katie developed a simple yet powerful method of inquiry called the work that showed people how to free themselves. Her insight into the mind is consistent with leading edge research in cognitive neuroscience. And the work has been compared to the Socratic dialogue, Buddhist teachings, and 12-step programs. But Katie developed her method without any knowledge of religion or psychology. The work is based purely on one woman's direct experience of how suffering is created and ended. It is astonishingly, astonishingly simple, accessible to people of all ages and backgrounds, and requires nothing more than a pen and paper and a willingness to open the mind. Katie saw right away that giving people her insights, sorry, or answers was of little value. Instead, she offers a process that can give people their own answers. The first people exposed to her work reported that the experience was transformational. And she soon began receiving invitations to teach the process publicly. Would since, you mind going ahead? Yeah, go ahead and finish the introduction for us, please. Okay, since 1986, Katie has introduced the work to millions of people around the world. In addition to public events, she has done the work in corporations, universities, schools, churches, prisons, and hospitals. Katie's joy and humor immediately put people at ease, and the deep insights and breakthroughs that participants quickly experience make the events captivating. Since 1998, Katie has directed the School for the Work, a nine-day curriculum offered several times a year. The school is an approved provider of continuing education units in the U.S., and many psychologists, counselors, and therapists report that the work is becoming the most important part of their practice. Katie also presents a four-day, no-body intensive, and an annual New Year's mental cleanse. Oh, that sounds great. A four-day program of continuous inquiry that takes place in Los Angeles at the end of December. She sometimes offers weekend workshops as well. Audio and vid video recordings of Katie facilitating the work on a wide range of topics, sex, money, the body, parenting, etc., are available at her events and on her website, thework.com. Katie's most important books <clears throat> are Loving What Is, which was written with her husband, the distinguished writer Stephen Mitchell, and has been translated into 35 languages. I Need Your Love, Is That True? with Michael Katz, A Thousand Names for Joy with Stephen Mitchell, and A Mind at Home with Itself with Stephen Mitchell. Her other books are Question Your Thinking, Change the World, Who Would You Be Without Your Story, Peace in the Present Moment, Selections from Blah 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 with Photograph blah, blah, and A Friendly Universe. Her books for children are Tiger Tiger, Is It True? and The Four Questions, both illustrated by Hans Wilhelm. Welcome to the work. Thank you, ma'am. Any, any comments at this point, guys? Okay, let's continue on with uh, the first section. Let's just have someone read the whole first section, then we'll talk about it. Uh, 
Hang on, buddy. Yes. Um, so I just really think it's fascinating that she didn't see a psychologist. What did it say? She didn't see a psychologist or um, trying to find where it said that. Um, anyway, she just, oh, instead she offers a process that can give people their own answers, right? Just taking it back to recovery. We don't tell anybody what to do. We only share what our experience is. And that's, that what, that is interestingly enough, what works, <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. And, and it says that she, this is her direct experience on how suffering is created and ended. This is how she's done it. And she just shows others similar to what we do. Uh, how she alleviated her own suffering and how she continues to do so. Who would like to read the first section for us? Uh, Amy, would you do that, please? Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Thank you. What is, what is, is. The only time we suffer is when we believe a thought that argues with what is. When the mind is perfectly clear, what is, is what we want. If you want reality to be different than it is, you might as well try to teach a cat to bark. You can try and try, and in the end, the cat will look up at you and say, meow. Wanting reality to be different than it is, is hopeless. And yet, if you pay attention, you'll notice that you believe thoughts like this dozens of times a day. People should be kinder. Children should be well-behaved. My husband or wife should agree with me. I should be thinner or prettier or more successful. These thoughts are ways of wanting reality to be different than it is. If you think that this sounds depressing, you're right. All the stress that we feel is caused by arguing with what is. People new to the work often say to me, but it would be disempowering to stop my argument with reality. If I simply accept reality, I'll become passive. I may even lose the desire to act. I answer them with a question. Can you really know that that's true? Which is more empowering? I wish I hadn't lost my job or I lost my job. What intelligent solutions can I find right now? The work reveals that what you think shouldn't have happened should have happened. It should have happened because it did happen and no thinking in the world can change it. This doesn't mean that you condone it or approve of it. It just means that you can see things without resistance and without the confusion of your inner struggle. No one wants their children to get sick. No one wants to be in a car accident. But when these things happen, how can it be helpful to mentally argue with them? We know better than to do that, yet we do it because we don't know how to stop. I am a lover of what is. Not because I'm a spiritual person, but because it hurts when I argue with reality. We can know that reality is good just as it is, because when we argue with it, we experience tension and frustration. We don't feel natural or balanced. When we stop opposing reality, action becomes simple, fluid, kind, and fearless. That's powerful, isn't it? Very very Taoist, especially that last little section, when we stop opposing reality, action becomes simple, fluid, kind, and fearless. I have a question beside that. How am I opposing reality today? And it's basically, what am I not accepting? You know, Comments, guys? Craig? I'm pretty much not accepting things that I don't want to happen. That makes sense. I'm quite happy to accept the things that I do want to happen. But I'm not happy as raining at the moment. I'm not happy that it's dark because that doesn't suit my purpose. I'm not surrendering to what is. I'm still trying to have that element of control over things. And I think that I need a little Byron Katie in my pocket, right? That when things go wrong during my day, she's just going to stop time and she's going to read this to me and say, right, Craig, let's have a look at it. Let's see what's going on and what are you arguing with? What do you guys think about on page six, that first full paragraph? The work reveals that what you think shouldn't have 
happened should have happened. It should have happened because it did happen. This doesn't mean that you condone or approve it. It just means that you see things without resistance and without the confusion of your inner struggle. Now, I don't know if things should have happened, but they did regardless. Um, so it looks like she came to the same conclusion that we do, that our peace comes from stopping the resistance of what is, you know? I really like that sentence uh, when she says, when I stop arguing with what is, it stops hurting. Right, that, that always comes. And I was looking in, in I was looking in your powerless but not helpful book and and, and saw that ex- acceptance is the answer and and in, in not verse, helpful. It's not helpless, Dennis. What it did I say? Helpful. Powerless but not help what did I say? But not helpful. You said powerless but not helpful. That's a very different meaning, Dennis. <laughs> Boy, did I sell that book? How about you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that happens. Maybe tell you what you thought about the book, buddy. Yeah. Please accept my errors as they are. Um, no, I was I was thinking on verse ten. It 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 reminds me when when uh, when you write that that can you be like a newborn baby? That acceptance that a newborn has to everything, to the surroundings, without inserting anything when when they're still in the toddler state. That's really that's really what it reminds me of. Um, that full acceptance. Anything else, Dennis? No. Okay. Pedro? Yeah. Um, I just relate this uh, this phrase so much with what I've I've been going through right now. I mean, uh, with my drinking addiction and this type of stuff and questioning. Um, why me? Why in the world I had to become an alcoholic and this type of stuff? I didn't deserve that. I mean, I was beer's best friend, you know? And, uh, but that's something I've talked a lot with Craig in the past. I mean, it it happened. I have to accept. Sometimes it can be harder or it can be easier, but uh, that is reality and that I cannot change. So this relates a lot to me. This speaks like direct to me. Pedro, I learned that I had to take the question of why totally out if if that's in my vocabulary it's wrong I never 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 need to ask why yeah Marla yes I I agree Pedro is one of the things I did when I first came in to recovery was why me and you know I'm the only one in my family that has a, a physical addiction issue and it was it was like why me? And I had to find out why am I such a you know an addict? And yeah, why not me? Um, it just was something I didn't understand though because I, I didn't no nobody around me drank a lot, so I didn't understand what I was doing to myself. Um, but once I un, like accepted the fact that I'm I am an addict and an alcoholic, which took me a long time to get to. The acceptance, that's when I started realizing that my I, I couldn't believe anything I was thinking because it was all just my ego put my ego um, colored everything that I thought and did. So my work is for me is to reduce my ego. And it's not why not it's it's not why me anymore. It's more like just take care of it, man. That's how I feel. Thank you, Marla. Thanks. Any other comments, guys? Before we head on to the next little section. Kate, can you read or, or are you reading on your phone? Is it possible? No, for you I'm to not read on my phone. Day? I can read. Okay, great. Thanks. Staying in your own business. I can find only three kinds of business in the universe. Mine, yours, and God's. For me, the word God means reality. Reality is God because it rules. Anything that is out of my control, your control, and everyone else's control, I call that God's business. Much of our stress comes from mentally living out of our own business. When I think you need to get a job, 
I want you to be happy. You should be on time. You need to take better care of yourself. I'm in your business. When I'm worried about earthquakes, floods, war, or when I will die, I am in God's business. If I am mentally in your business or in God's business, the effect is separation. I noticed this in early 1986. When I mentally went into my mother's business, for example, with a thought like, my mother should understand me, I immediately experienced a feeling of loneliness. And I realized that every time in my life that I had felt hurt or lonely, I had been in someone else's business. If you are living your life and I am mentally living your life, who is here living mine? We are both over there. Being mentally in your business keeps me from being present in my own. I am separate from myself, wondering why my life doesn't work. To think that I know what's best for everyone else is to be out of my business. Even in the name of love, it is pure arrogance, and the result is tension, anxiety, and fear. Do I know what's right for me? That is my only business. Let me work with that before I try to solve your problems for you. If you understand the three kinds of business enough to stay in your own business, it could free your life in a way that you can't even imagine. The next time you're feeling stress or discomfort, ask yourself whose business you're in mentally, and you may burst out laughing. That question can bring you back to yourself, and you may come to see that you've never really been present that you've been mentally living in other people's business all your life. Just to notice that you're in someone else's business can bring you back to your own wonderful self. And if you practice it for a while, you may come to see that you don't have any business either and that your life runs perfectly well on its own. Wow. Comments? Yep. Today, I find it's best. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. This proves I don't know what's good for me. And if I don't know what's good for me, then I don't know what's good or bad for you or anyone else. So I'm better off if I don't give advice, don't figure I know what's best, and just accept life on life's terms as it is today, especially my own life as it actually is. Thank you, ma'am. And I really like the way she put this at the bottom of page seven, top of eight, if you're living your life and I am mentally living your life, who is here living mine? We're both over there. Being mentally in your business keeps me from being present in my own. I am separate from myself wondering why my life doesn't work. That is so simple, yet so powerful. That's a lot of what you see in uh, Al-Anon, too, isn't it, Amy? Yeah. I don't know if anyone else here has gone to Al-Anon. I have not. So. I think I'm gonna, have... Yeah, I think I'm going to put a filter on my emails. That when I, res- I was going to say when I react to an email, but when I respond to an email, there should be this little, this little thing be- before I start typing, it comes up. Is this your business, somebody else's business, or God's business? <laughs> I'm actually going to draw that in my windscreen in my van just for the next person that cuts me off is, is it my business his or God's I think it's a great a great way of looking at things just before I get involved in it you know is it actually anything to do with me what's the what's the outcome what, what's what's the desired outcome what, what am I actually looking to achieve by getting involved in this is it just to make myself look better and you smaller but but she also talks there, Craig, about even if we have a motivation of love, it's wrong too, you know. Yep. So she was saying that you know we can't we can't straighten other people out, and we learn that in recovery when we're sponsoring, we talk about it all the time, that we just share our experience. We don't take the responsibility or the blame, you know, for the outcome. But we we, we still try to do. Well, some some of us do. We, we try to. I think. I think it also goes back to when we try to justify our emotions and our feelings. Like the big book talks about, we justify our anger. When we justify our anger, we're also trying to justify why I should really get involved with what's going on in everybody else's world. Uh, again, I really need to start looking at 
why am I doing it? What's what's the payoff? So to do a quick mini fourth step, what's the payoff for me getting involved in it? And you know, what's the desired outcome for for actually getting involved in it? Thanks, Greg. Kate. I really like I really like the part you pointed out, buddy, about the separating yourself from yourself. Because I think for me, it speaks to me a lot more clearly where it says, you know, if you're focusing on somebody else or, or even focusing on the, the God's business, you're not focusing on yourself. Then it does. If someone says like, no, 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 don't focus on other people because that's wrong. You know, cause I feel like when someone's saying, you know, you're rude if you're like getting in somebody's business. I feel like people have said that to me a lot. I mean, not a lot, but like it's nosy if you're getting in somebody's business or it's none of your business. You know, that kind of reasoning makes you feel guilty. Like, like, oh, you're being a bad person because you're, you're getting in other people's business. But like the reasoning of like you're separating from your own self, I mean, that's kind of like a positive reason to stay out of people's business and stay out of God's business. Like, I think it's a more positive look at it. I think so too. Thank you, Kate. What do y'all think about her perception of God? I don't want us all to start comparing gods here, but I, I just like her approach to this. It's back to everything that she's talking about is pointing to the moment that she looks at God as reality. Anything that's out of my control, your control, and everyone else's control, I call that God's business. Uh, and God is, in her thinking, she describes God as what is. That really helped me the first time I heard her say that. I said, yeah, I said, that's a good way to phrase that. I like that. Any more comments before we move on to the next section? And once we lay some foundation here, I don't know how far we're going to get today, but once we lay the foundation, then we'll start doing what she actually calls the work, which are just four questions. So, and it really works well. No pun intended. Um, I think we should, I think we should do I think we should do that exercise on each of us. I think we should pick a person and do and do the exercise on. Let's read this part next, Craig, and then we'll see how to how we Dennis is laughing because he knows what comes next. But just 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 what you're talking about with the, with the reality. I just thought if if we're not if we're not attuning ourselves to reality, are we being delusional? Yeah, I think so, but I don't think we knew that we were delusional. I do it was know. All that, it was all that we knew. Yeah, it's just been pointed out to me that you know because I'm I'm because I'm taking my attention away from the here and now and what is actually going on in front of me rather than living in this imagination of Craig's world. Actually, I think me mispronouncing a body's book was me stepping away from reality, right? Because I was too much in my thought about what I wanted to say, and I just totally mispronounced that because I was not in the moment. And that's where those little mistakes often happen, I think. And we can stray away from it further and further in that Delusion, I think that's a good way to say it when we're not present, right? Even without knowing it when we're in thoughts. Um, for me, that I'm separate from myself, it, it shows that you split it in two persons. And, and, and it reminds me of Eckhart Tolle, another book, I'm, I'm the guy that wrote The Power of Now, also talking about reality is what it is right now, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 when he said I wanted to kill myself, he was so depressed. He he found that duality in oneself that is so miserable, and and that's exactly what it is. I'm separate from myself, the higher self and the human self. Um, I quite like Tull I quite like Tully's work. I think he's I think he's really good at explaining. One of them is all. It was called the Power of Now. Funny enough, um, and that was explaining how he stays in the moment. And a lot of it is surrendering to reality rather than living the way that I think things should be or the way that I want them to be rather than just how they are. That's good. I I really I think I don't know if it got to that point, but I'm actually using that a lot. I'm I'm 
I'm falling in love with what is, is really a powerful statement. And, and, and that happens whenever I'm not, <laughs> right? <laughs> whenever well, well, I'm, I'm off to the races. So, so what, about when it's, what about when it's something that, that you're not happy with? Are, are we still really falling in love with what's happened? Because I'd be like, do you know what, that, that's happened and I'm not happy about it. I actually am because then I'm just accepting my unhappiness with it. So even that I'm, I'm, I'm a little disturbed, I'm, I'm kind of still in that falling in and out of love. So when something happens, I'm still, okay, now I'm just pissed. And then I can kind of, then I can kind of sit with that. So it's not totally awareness, but it's kind of getting there, I guess. I don't know. And the questions that she asks, Craig, help bring you to the moment, you know, help you to, to identify those thoughts that we're still believing that we're not realizing that we're really believing, you know? So it, it it's a process because we, we have to really peel the onion in these situations and that we're circumstances that we're not accepting because we think it's because of one thing. And for me, the reality is it's usually something different. You know, it's not what I think it is. And I like what she said at the end of that section about if you practice this for a while, you may come to see that you don't have any business either and that your life runs perfectly well on its own. That idea that we think that we've got so much uh, influence and effort to put out to manage our life when we're really, in, I'm in my way more often than I make my way. Dennis? No, I have nothing. I was just okay, well, agreeing. Thank you, sir. Uh, who wants to read next? Uh, Craig, read this next section, please, sir. I got lost. Where are we? What are you doing? Are you not paying attention to what's going on? We're, we're on meeting your thoughts with understanding. Obviously okay. not in the oh, moment. Sorry, in this be. very moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too but busy. That's the Aladon in me coming out. I'm going to fix I'm gonna fix it for Craig real fix. Real, real quick, okay? I'm going to fix it for you. Thank you. Right. We'll put the <laughs> subtitles in the in the comments just for people that don't understand, okay? Meeting your thoughts with understanding. A thought is harmless unless we believe it. It is not our thoughts, but the attachment to our thoughts that causes suffering. Attaching to a thought means believing that it's true without inquiring. A belief is a thought that we've been attaching to often for years. Most people that they think they are what their thoughts tell them they are. One day I noticed that I wasn't breathing. I was being breathed. Then I also noticed to my amazement that I wasn't thinking, that I was actually being thought, and that thinking isn't personal. Do you wake up in the morning and say to yourself, I think I won't think today? It's too late, you, or you're already thinking. Thoughts just appear. They come out of nothing and go back to nothing. Like clouds moving across the empty sky, they come to pass not to stay. There is no harm in them until we attach to them as if they were true. No one has ever been able to control his thinking, although people may tell the story of how they have. I don't let go of my thoughts. I meet them with understanding, then they let go of me. Thoughts are like the breeze or the leaves on the trees or the raindrops falling. They appear like that and through inquiry or inquiry, inquiry, we can make friends with them. Would you argue with a raindrop? Raindrops aren't personal and neither are thoughts. Once a painful concept is met with understanding, the next time it appears, you may find it interesting. What used to be the nightmare is now just interesting. The next time it appears, you may find it funny. The next time you may not even notice it. This is the power of loving what is. Thank you, sir. Any comments there, Craig? That's very much like the Michael Singer's way of doing things rather than attaching on to the thought. Just letting it come and go, just just like a car. Just come up the street. You don't throw yourself onto the car and go with it. You just let it come up the street and let it go. 
and that's it. You don't think about it for the rest of the day. You just it's just a fleeting thought. Um, but I do, I, I, I definitely get what they're talking about there because I do find myself attaching to things when I'm not working my program as well as I should be. When I've missed that time of prayer and meditation, if I've not been out from a walk first thing in the morning, not read my not read my daily readings, or maybe if I've if I've woke up and went straight to work, so fire up the phone, fire up the, the laptop rather than taking time for myself. My very my very first react. I find myself reacting a lot quicker rather than responding to how things actually are. I find when I'm centered, and when I've had that time to myself, and that what they call the holy hour, that time just spending yourself and doing what you really need to do to get yourself centered. I find myself reacting very very quickly. Whereas if I've had that time for myself. Nothing major seems to, to bother me. It's just a case of, oh, look at that. Somebody's upset. You know, so I don't I don't try to get involved in it. I don't try to interfere with it. And I don't take things as personally as I do when I've not had that time to myself. What do you think about where she's talking about that thoughts aren't personal? That was a new concept for me. Yeah, because my ego makes them very personal. I mean, aren't they our thoughts? So would it, would it not be personal? No. Well, like she's saying, it's not really your thoughts. You didn't come up with it, just like your breathing, right? Exactly. So, so it's really not yours to believe, and they, they come from nothing, they go to nothing. Um, that's uh, That's really how I... But you know what? It's funny when we read this. This really reminds me so much on page 84 to 86 in the big book. Uh, especially upon awakening, there's so much acceptance in that uh, in that read, and, and there's so much acceptance, especially about the thoughts here that we just let them be as they are, right? And 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 not try not to get attached. That's 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 when I'm getting in trouble when I think it's me <laughs> that I am thoughts. How do you like this on the bottom of page nine? I don't let go of my thoughts. I meet them with understanding, then they let go of me. Yeah, that means that you accept them as they are, and then then they actually let go, right? That's that's my experience with it. Whenever I struggle with something, when I just realize what it is and I can observe them instead of getting involved with them, then then they disappear easier. Then there's not that struggle. The big actually it's funny because the biggest struggle is when you don't want to feel those things. I think Greg was talking about that. You don't want to feel those horrible things when things goes wrong or when people are being mean to you or whatever it is. Those feelings are horrible. So we start fighting it internally and then it becomes really, really bad. <laughs> right? So, so, oh, this is just what it is. This is what I'm feeling right now. And then I can let go of it. I, I, can think, let go of me. <laughs> I think I've become more attached to my thoughts. Um, there is the negativity bias. So for every for every one bad thing that happens, we have to have um, four positive experiences to balance out the negative negative impact of this has on, on our life. So I think it's very it's very quick for us to attach to these these thoughts, particularly negative thoughts. It's again going back to Eckhart Tolle. He talks about the pain body and how we thrive on all this negativity because it kind of takes attention away from us. We kind of talk about people a lot more because it takes the spotlight off us and we're kind of shining that light on everybody else. I think if I could change my thinking, it would be more of a positive thoughts. So if we have eighty to 90,000 thoughts on a daily basis and 80% of those thoughts were from the day before, and a lot of my thoughts were negative, it's only it's only natural that that's going to carry across into the next day. So I think if I if I could let go of um I was I was almost going to say if I can let go of Facebook, but I can't let go of Facebook because we have the Die Over Understanding Facebook page that takes up a lot of time and all, all the other recovery pages that I'm involved in, I find it very I find it very easy to slip into the mainstream social media. So a lot of things get fed that way. And I know myself that sometimes when I'm looking at this stuff, it's not that good for me. Um, and then when I come home, I just want to sit and watch the news because 
I want to feed myself more of it. So try to stick to the actual groups that I'm involved in. Be of service to people, help people out, celebrate the milestones and the achievements, and then just try and leave it at that. So I, I look at that as attaching myself to the thoughts because I'm very quickly attached myself to the thoughts of everybody else that's going on. I want to get involved in all the conspiracy theories and everything else that's going on in the world rather than just coming home and spending time with the people that are here and now with me. Thank you, sir. Kate? I just have a question. So she's saying that we have to meet our thoughts with understanding. So I can understand that, like, they, my example from earlier, like my friend wasn't coming over. I was feeling insecure about that. I can be like, okay, I'm feeling insecure. I can understand that, whatever. Make the, disregard those thoughts and feel happier. And that did work. But if the thoughts come from nothing, from what we were talking about earlier, how can you meet them with understanding? What do you think the purpose? I hate to answer a question with a question, but I'm going to do it. Uh, what do you think the purpose of your thoughts are? I think that might be a good place to begin. Uh, why are you having these thoughts anyway? Um, for me, I think from what I've learned and experienced, that my thoughts are usually trying to support whatever fears I'm pacifying in my life. Uh, you know, if I didn't have a fear of failure, I would not have thoughts. I would not, you know, have thoughts very much. I wouldn't think of failing or if I did, they would be gone. I wouldn't pacify them or or entertain them, I guess would be another way to say it. Um, I think that looking at that first to see what's draw, what's the magnet, what's the thought magnet, you know, of all those things coming through. Because if thoughts just are, they, uh, I like the way that she said, they come to pass, not to stay. So if we've got these thoughts coming by like clouds, what is it that's attracting those particular thoughts? So that's kind of the way I would look at it, Kate. I think that would be uh, meeting them with understanding, actually having more of a meeting them with uh, understanding of what they are. I think maybe a way to look at that. Um, for, for me, I'm having thoughts. Usually, if they're negative thoughts, they're things that are pacifying you know, trying to pacify a fear. Uh, that that's the way I look at that. Uh, anyone else, guys? Does that help, Kate, at all, or do we need to talk about that some more? I think it helps. I think it's not the easiest thing for. I think it's a little bit hard for me to understand overall, but I think that helps. I mean, it's a way to change our thinking about our thoughts, you know, because I didn't realize how many of my thoughts are not true. I mean, almost right. all the little things I have that roll around, you know, uh, if we're talking about the negative thoughts that I have, not if I'm troubleshooting or trying to figure something out, not those thoughts. I'm talking about the things that uh, are troublesome thoughts, you know, um, most of them aren't true. I mean, I don't know how many times a day I create a create a scenario that that scenario never happens. It's all the time. Right. I'm sure y'all don't do that, right? Right. And I was like really pleasantly surprised that when I applied this method to that thinking, I, I felt so much better. I was just like, oh, no, that's just a thought that I'm having that is not actually true. And then I felt happy. Like it exactly. really worked. It was really, and it hadn't occurred to me that just because I had those thoughts, they were not like legitimate ideas that were actually happening. They were just, it was just a thought. The way it went. 
So that, you know, it's, it's a really good practice. Anything else on that guys? Because we're going to stop there for today. We're not going to go to the putting the mind on paper on page 11. We'll start there next week. I would suggest reading ahead and looking at this because this talks about how to fill out the worksheet. And as you read this, think of one person or one resentment or one circumstance that you want to work this on personally. Okay, I'll I'll go for Amy. I'll I'll, I'll go Amy. Amy, who are you taking? <laughs> no, we're not talking about people here. We're just talking to, unless we have a resentment against someone here. But I mean a real life resentment that you're working with or working on that we can put this to use. And I think doing it that way will make it um uh, make it more real and viable for us. In, that'd be a really good. Game, it'd be a really good game of guess who. Everybody would be like, "I wonder who he's talking about." Hmm. Anything else, guys, from this section that we need to? You know, I yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Amy. I was just thinking about this last um, part about once a painful concept is met with understanding, the next time it appears. You may find it interesting. I was just thinking about how all of the stuff that I used to do, well, it really made me think of the prom, the, one of the nice set promises. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we'll see how our experience can benefit others. I mean, all of that horrible, that like at the time it was happening, I couldn't believe it was happening to me, right? I, I was such a victim, um, you know, losing custody of the kids, getting arrested. I mean, whatever. Um, but now... Um, you know, and I used to drink more and drug more to to stop those icky feelings of guilt and shame and remorse. And now when those stories and those experiences come up, it's only because I'm trying to help someone else get through them. Um, and so it's it's interesting, right? Painful concept is met with understanding because I understand that now that I have a disease called alcoholism, that I have a disease called addiction and that it's a thing, all the other things that go along with that, right? But now it's interesting to me that those experiences I can use to help other people. Yeah, that was it. Thank you, Amy. Any other comments, guys? It's been a good conversation today. And we could talk some more next week before we start this section. If more questions come up during the week on our thoughts, and there's a lot of podcasts I've heard in the last couple of years on thoughts. There was a good one on 10% Happier. Uh, it's been a while back. Um, that was on thoughts and how it was like uh, 99 point, I mean, like some huge number of your thoughts are just not true. And when I first heard that, I was like, no, that can't be that much. But um, and how many thoughts, thousands and thousands of thoughts we have, you know, every hour, you know, all those things. I mean, it was just an incredible amount of thoughts that we have and uh, just changing my perspective on my thinking. Maybe that's why meditation does such a good job of uh, so much help to us that it teaches us how to let that stuff pass on by, you know? Any other closing thoughts before uh, we get out of here today? Y'all have a great week and we will see you next week. Thank you guys. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.